have a dream. A tiny elephant would be my dream fictional creature as a pet. Just like a mini live functioning elephant. <laughs> I just want that to be true one day. <laughs> Please welcome Jonathan Freeman and Linda Larkin, Aladdin panel. Please welcome aboard. Hello, there you go. Thank you. Hello, everyone. There you go. Welcome. Thank you. We came straight from the floor. It's been really busy already, and you guys are awesome. Thank you for being here this morning, all right, or this afternoon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, we're here for it. We're here for it, and we're happy. Pittsburgh is, is very beautiful. I've never been before, and it's Same. a beautiful city. It is. Yeah. yeah. Have you been here before? No. Well, welcome. Thank you so much. How Do you guys do very many Comic-Cons? Is we, this a new thing for you guys? So or? we have been doing them maybe five years nice. together. Something I've been like doing that. them seven years. Yeah. Yeah. You'll find that the, the Pittsburgh hey. Comic Con, these people are just amazing. It's a great bunch of folks. It's such a great positive experience. And I have a couple questions right off the bat, and then we'll get okay. to their questions. So okay. just some general questions right off the bat individually. How did you uh, get into voice acting? That's a great question. You, there's something in that question that I, I love to address. So we are actors that happen to have an opportunity to work in voiceovers. But every, I would say 95% of the actors that I know who work in voiceover were actors first, acted on stage, in film, in television. So voice acting, which is definitely what I too, is really just acting, but in a different room, right? So the way that I originally got into it was I was going on auditions, and this just happened to be one of them, a radio commercial, and I happened to get it, and then my agents were like, oh, she can do voiceovers. So it was sort of the gateway to a world of, you know, voiceover opportunities. This is a hot mic. Yeah, I gotta, it's like a voiceover I, thing. I don't want to blow your ears out. You hear that pop? A little bit of pop. I can get you one with a windscreen if you'd like. That's okay. okay. I'm a pro. I'll just, a you pro. know, do this. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, I'm a puppeteer in addition to being an actor. I started out as a kid actor in Cleveland, Ohio. Not that... Oh, cool. And... Uh, so I started working as a kid actor when I was quite young, seven or eight years old in Cleveland, Cleveland Playhouse and other theaters, regional theaters, in and around Cleveland. And I started taking puppeteer cl puppeteering classes at the Cleveland Museum of Art when I was very young. I became a puppeteer and I sort of rena remained a puppeteer for a long time. And uh, I don't know, when I moved to New York, I, it was a big thing to audition for commercials and voiceovers. And that's the way a lot of actors um, made money, you know, to try to pursue the rest of their art, which, you know, at the time, I don't know, commercials and voiceovers just were sort of seemed like extra money for extra time because it wasn't really anything important or serious, you know. But it was actually a very, very good way to make money, so it turned out to be very important. Um, and that's, that's about it. And that's, you know, I auditioned for Aladdin just like I auditioned for any other show. And, uh, other things that I did the same. What was the audition process like? Can we talk about that? Or if not? you can't, you can't. It's okay. I don't think we actually... Well, we can't specifically talk can. about that audition what process. What is an audition process there like? There we go. Yeah, so right. just in case anyone's not aware, there are they, they're guidelines. They're briefed, I briefed right? Them. Okay, thank you. So, you know, we're, we're doing our best with the new circumstances. Doing great. So the stereotypical audition process. Well, I don't know if it was for a, if it was for a, 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 a commercial or radio commercial or something like that. You would just go into a studio, and it would just be usually a casting director initially, and that was it. You'd read the copy, and then you'd go home, 
and that was it. And maybe you got a call back, and maybe they just called you and said you booked the job, and you know, it could be very simple. Uh, with other kinds of voiceover work, it sometimes is several auditions, and then it sort of happens in the same way. It's a little vague uh, to talk about it because it's very specific to different projects and how different people work. Um, I could talk a little bit about how it's different now than when we started because it idea. has changed a lot. Um, when it, see, this is the great thing about not being able to talk about the same things that yes. it actually gets us mm -hmm. talking about other things that we don't usually get to explore. But one thing that's different now is you don't really go to auditions. You really record them on your phone Ooh. yourself. It's, it's rare that you're going into a studio with a casting director and auditioning, which is really how it was for us for the first, well, for me, for the first half of my career, at least. Yeah. And, and now a lot of people have a sound booth in their house, or That's right. they convert like a closet into a sound booth, and it's yep. it's perfect. It's very sufficient. Yeah, we have a, a multi-use closet because <laughs> we right. have a small apartment in New York, and we have a quiet closet that houses my husband's guitars that he's not playing, and <laughs> some winter clothes, and that's where I will record an audition if I have something. The, the other thing that changes. You know, there didn't used to be phone patching. There didn't used to be technology. So you actually physically had to be in a room with someone and usually with a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder wow. until they, that changed. But it, so it's, it's been a process that has evolved over time, and it's changed a lot. We used to be flown to California to record our voiceover stuff. That's right, yeah. But n that would never happen. But now. that's because we had to. Like you had to, you really had to be in the same room with the people that you were working with. So the old style auditions would actually record your voice. They'd have people listen to it, then they would decide from there. Yes, and usually it would be one time, but occasionally it would be. There would be a callback, mm -hmm. and in some cases, it could be months of callbacks. Wow. In some very special cases. Yeah, the, the radio commercials and television stuff are usually more immediate. Right. Those are usually, you know, people want it yesterday, so <laughs> different from theater. So, so you, Jonathan, you mentioned you were into puppetry. How did that start, and what elements of acting do you use with puppetry, or do they go back and forth? Right. I, I recently uh, was asked a similar question, and it's sort of, I do... It doesn't matter what I'm doing. It doesn't matter if I'm puppeteering, if I'm doing uh, a voice for something, if I'm doing something for television, film, stage. I, my process is basically the same. You know, I start with the text. I have an idea about the character in my head, and I just, I just begin. I don't have a lot of preparation and hocus pocus. I, I sort of find my way through it by, you know, getting and digging in there, and it can sometimes be difficult. But um, I guess, you know... I was about seven years old, and there was a guy who was, who was known as the Dean of American Puppetry. His name was George Latshaw. I don't know if anybody here even would remember that name. And he was a fantastic puppeteer, and he gave classes for adults and also for kids at the Cleveland Museum of Art. And I somehow got involved with it, and it was fantastic because you created character physically, and then you gave them movement, physical movement, and voice. So um, that's a pretty good way of working, actually, I find. I can, I can find a way to do that with almost everything I do. Uh, which leads me to the next question. How do you make the transition from theater to film to video game work? I mean, different prep, different mindset, different uh, homework? It's, it's actually kind of subtle, and it also depends on the project, because if it's a very exuberant, extreme character, you and there's not a camera right in your face, it's, it's maybe not, the adjustment may not be so huge. Um, I mean, in terms of puppeteering, it, you know, there's no, it's the same thing with animated stuff. I mean, there are no parameters. You just jump off the cliff every time you go to do, you go to work on something. And um, I did a, a series uh, for many years, and so you kind of like, you, you sort of, you just kind of, you pick up a puppet, 
if you've been using it for a long time and it just, it, it's all there at a certain point, you know, the, the way you physicalize the, the puppet, the way you use your voice for that puppet, it, it just, it, it happens when you have the time, when you have the luxury of time to actually work on these things, it really is fantastic. I, just I think have, um, sometimes when we are recording like a video game, it's a little bit different technology than we're, when we're recording something in animation or for film. So a video game, we might have to be more articulate or over-enunciate, or especially a toy. That's something when we record for, it almost doesn't sound natural when you're doing it in the recording booth, but when it goes into the toy, it you can see how it it brings it to a level that sounds natural. So uh, technology changes all the time, so now toys are more sophisticated than they were even when we started doing sure. them. But yeah. it, it's the technology does sometimes influence the performance. Ooh. And, we have and to video games, too, are very sort of time-specific sometimes. You have X amount of seconds to get something in, you know, or they want you to make it longer or whatever. And that, so that's all, that's all kind of hard. So um, <laughs> I know voice acting, uh, it's probably just as regimental. Is there any improvisation at all? I mean, I, I know you've worked with uh, Robin Williams and Gilbert Gottfried. I mean, is there any kind of improvisation that goes on, or is it just like, yes. this is yes. every... Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, yes, because when you're working with actors that are improvising, you also have to be improvising right along with them. Exactly. And you have responses to things that they say, so you have to be on your toes and ready to respond with something that's not written on the page in front of you. And when you're working with people whose background is stand-up comedy, it really is yeah. sort of like... A wild ride. ride. Yeah. It, you know, any more than two people in the studio means an audience, so... <laughs> It was. It was. It, it could we, have been. A, we were the audience as well. Been a ride. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Actor and audience mm -hmm. at the same time. So we're going to get to audience questions. Anyone on this side of the room have a question? Head over to there. Kyle will take care of you. If you have a question on this side of the room, head over there, and I'll be with you. We're going to do two questions at a time. But I have one more question. This one's for you, Linda. Since 2011, you've been honored as a Disney legend. Can you tell us about that? Is that? Sure. That is amazing. Um. What I can talk about, I think, is that um, it was an honor, and it came with four park passes for the rest of my life to any park except Tokyo. So <laughs> that part was really, really fun and special, and I get to go to the park, and I can take three of you with me. <laughs> me plus three. So, <laughs> I have some volunteers. Okay, go. great. Um, I don't live in California or Florida, so I don't get to go as often as I would if I lived close, but I go as often as I can. And I take Jonathan with yeah, me. I, I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're going to get to some audience questions. Once again, everybody's been briefed to not talk about things that would uh, violate the strike. Thank, Thank you all for your support. We really do appreciate to, it. Thank you. We'd so be much. happy to talk about the strike if you have questions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you guys are headed back to your tables after this, or do you have a photo op? We have this? a photo op that should be really quick. Okay. And we should be back at our tables by, I think someone said, 2.15 or 2.30. Awesome. Like Let's get to some questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have our first question question over here, your name and your question. My name is Carol, and this question is for both of you. When you got that fateful phone call letting you know that you got the role of Jafar no, and Princess uh, Jasmine. Uh, when they got a phone call about getting something like that, yeah. yeah. What's it like? When, I when, when you got that fateful phone call that you were cast in the movie, what was your reaction? Did you both freak out? Did you throw a chair? Did you just like, did you, what, did you did, were, were you excited that you were going to be in a Disney movie? Thank you for the question. Well, the way we'll answer it is when we get exciting news about a project that we really care about, um, it's a great feeling. For me, I, I was at the beginning of my career, and I was very excited. And 
something I do, and I have to be more careful doing that now, is I jump up and down a lot. So <laughs> now I try to take it a little easy. But I was jumping up and down when I got good news in the past about exciting projects. What she said. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Next Thank question. We don't want them to go through a lot of chairs throwing them. So <laughs> next question. Hi, I'm Dana. I was just wondering what it was like working with Robin Williams, if you could talk about that. We can talk about that. We can talk about Robin, sure. and we love talking about Robin. So, Dana, thank you for your question. Well, we, uh, I didn't have that much time in the studio with him, I'm, as you know, from the project. Uh, but uh, he was a delightful person, as was everybody that worked on the project. I have to say, I, I can't remember a bad day. I can't remember a bad day in the studio with anybody. And uh, it was a it was a fantastic time from start to finish, and it sort of made us realize that we were doing something special because it was a special person. When I met Robin, I had grown up watching him on television, and yes, Mork and Mindy, I was there for it every week. You had to wait then to watch your favorite TV show. <laughs> and everybody had to watch it at the same time wherever they lived in the world uh, or in the country. So I grew up with that and then Dead Poet Society was like coming of age movie at a time when I was that age. So for me, Robin was just a hero. And I was really nervous to meet him and and work with him because I just didn't feel worthy. And he made me feel so safe and so comfortable and he was so kind the first minute I met him. And that I wasn't expecting. I expected him to be funny. I expected him to be intimidating. I did not expect him to be so gentle. And I appreciated it. And. We knew each other for 20 years. I got to see him throughout the 20 years on Broadway. He welcomed us backstage when we would go see him in a play that he was doing. Anytime I would run into him, he would always greet me with such affection and make me feel very special. So he was wonderful. Thank you for letting us talk about him. Okay, and we're going to go to the other side of the room. Over here, we got two questions. A question right here. Hi, guys. Um, so I have a question for Jonathan. So um, when doing Broadway, if you could give me three tips that I can remember because I'm big into performing. Um, so I would just love some honest opinions into going into acting and just all that stuff. Anything you can share? Yes, we can talk about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, are you talking about getting into the business? Tips about performing? Just tips about performing. I think I can probably give you one really important tip because it's different for everybody, but authenticity is a very important thing, no matter what you're doing. Whether you're doing something that's very small and honest, or something that's extravagant and ridiculous, um, there is a, thir a certain kind of authenticity that if you bring it to your work, it, it, it won't let you down. Because usually it means it's coming from a very straightforward, honest place, and it Really, it, 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 it's, the best, it's the best advice I can think to give anybody these days, especially people who are younger than me, which is just about everyone in this room. Uh, so that would be, my, that would be the, the thing that I would say. What do you think, Linda? Be yourself, yeah. right? Yes, absolutely. I think that that is great advice. I think that it, it can be, it sounds really easy, but it's challenging because you can get nervous. You can try to please the person who's hiring you and all of those things can get in the way of you being authentically you and bringing your gifts into the room. So it's, it's easy up here, but it's actually kind of hard to do. It takes a little work. Okay. And Thank you. a question right here. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello. It's nice to meet you. Hello. You too. Um, thank you. Uh, well, 
I was just wondering, I mean, I know that people are most um, familiar with your work in Aladdin, um, but I actually really um, enjoyed it when you uh, voiced uh, King Paimon more recently in Hell of a Boss. Do uh, you think maybe you could talk about your experiences working on that show? Yes, that's a, that's a very, that was a very modern experience for me because it's a, the, the woman that does, produces, writes, and did the original characters and drawings for that is named Vivian Madreno, and she's quite, she's quite spectacular. Uh, and she just decided she was just going to, she has two, two series that I know of. The other one I think is called Has Been Hotel. They're uh, primarily, if you don't know about this, they are, online uh, series really for young adults and adults. They're not really for young kids. They're very edgy and I don't think young kids would even like them, frankly, or get them. Uh, so that was a very new experience for me because I, I was working on it during the pandemic. And uh, so we were really isolated in order to be able to do it. And it, it, was, it was just, um, it was fantastic to not know that there was a deadline, to not know that uh, there was uh, any, any studio like looking over your shoulder and, you know, going to worry about what was, you know, what, how, what the writing was like, what it was going to be like. It just was this, this a very different, it's a very new experience. It's, it's not so new for a lot of people I know who are younger than I am, but for me it was a very new experience. And it's kind of, it was refreshing. Okay. And speaking of refreshing, we do have some water up there for you. If you do get a little thirsty, oh, we do have water you. there for you. And it looks like the rest of the questions are all on that side of the room. They like me better, I'm saying. That's, Sorry, that's Mike. understandable. <laughs> Hi. Um, so aside from work, in your personal life, what passions do you have? What books do you read? What causes do you support? What food do you like? Talk a little bit about your personal lives. Thank you. That's really nice. I, I have a passion for... For dogs, I have been, some people in here might know this already, I have been a volunteer for the Guide Dog Foundation for the Blind for 22 years. I've raised 12 puppies for them, and I've had so many experiences with them, but I've, I've had puppies that go into the recording studio with me, go on the train with me, in restaurants, everywhere, because my job as a volunteer puppy walker is to socialize them. So when they go back to the foundation after 12 months, they've experienced everything. Nothing is shocking to them. And then they can get serious about their training. So we had, my husband is also an actor. We had one puppy that um, my husband, for fun, plays electric guitar in our apartment in New York City. We have really good neighbors. <laughs> we had one puppy that was going to a, a blind woman who had a teenage son who played electric guitar. And they said to us, "He just we have to do one more test with him to make sure that this is going to be an appropriate home. We have to make sure he doesn't get you know, spooked by the electric guitar. And I said, oh, I can tell you already, he's going to pass. He's been listening to it every day, his whole puppy life. Oh. So that, that was a wonderful match. They did great together. And that's, to answer one of your questions in a really long way, that's been my passion for the past 22 years. Wow. Thank you. I, I, got, I got very involved with the um, autism community because of my work, and it started now a very long time ago, it seems. Uh, it happened quite unexpectedly and naturally with a family, uh, the Suskind family. I don't know if you, anybody knows about Ron Suskind and his writing or the book that he wrote called Life Animated, and, and we also did a, a um, documentary that was uh, nominated for an Academy Award one year by the same name, Life Animated. And Beautiful I, documentary, if you get an opportunity to see it. Yeah, it's great. The book is great that he wrote, too, and the, you know. So that was something that was very unexpected, and um, I didn't know very much about it. And I've become a great advocate and uh, have been on, have sat on panels. Um, 
with people that know a lot more about it than I do. And so I've learned a lot. It's been a great, it's kind of been a great experience. I never thought in a million years that it would be something that I would even know about. But it's, I mean, a lot of people are, there's a lot of awareness now and I'm very happy and proud to have been part of it. Thank you. I have a question. Do we get a trophy after the yeah. panel? Is that what those are You for? get all of those. <laughs> We'll put them in your car. <laughs> Next question. Um, hi. So my question is, it's more of an, like an icebreaker question. If you could have any fictional creature as a pet, what would it be? <laughs> I have an answer. I have a dream. A tiny elephant would be my dream fictional creature as a pet. Just like a mini live functioning elephant. I just want that to be true one day. How long have you known about this? It, I'm just it curious might, myself. It might have come out of a certain film where they shrunk an elephant oh. down, ah. um, and it got stuck in my head as something that would be really awesome in real life. So that's my fictional creature. I don't have a fictional creature, but it's fictional in that I always wanted a you know, a pet that talked, which is, you know, why I was always attracted to Disney villains, I think, as a, from, a young, from the time I was very young. Like, a lot of Disney villains have talking animals. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> Thank you. That's a fun question. Okay. All right. Hello, Linda and Jonathan. Great oh. to have both of you with us. So my two-part question is, my first is for Jonathan, how would you describe your experience on working on Shining Time Station? That was one of my show, favorite shows growing up. Shining Time Station? Yeah. 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 Am I, uh, We're wondering if we can talk about it, oh, oh. and it's oh, am I PBS? Probably not. I'm not sure if PBS so my second. is struck or not. Well, maybe we Good thing you have a second generally part about the experience. No. Yeah, li live action is off the table. TV animation is okay, and video games are okay, but live okay. action is not. Okay. So I think that's a thumbs up. All right, so my second question for both of you, Jonathan and Linda. What were your favorite parts about, about voicing the characters Princess Jasmine mm. and Jafar, especially being a part of Kingdom Hearts? Okay, we, we can talk about um, our experience working in animation yes. in general. And, and it has been really wonderful to work in, all the, in animation and all the different mediums of animation in in video games in feature animation in television animation it's been it's been a really long journey for us and i think unexpected for me i thought i was doing one project and i ended up doing the voice of a character for 30 years and continue to do it as well so it's there've been a lot of unexpected twists and turns and surprises and and it's really been great so that's how i can answer it without getting too specific also i can say that one thing that's really interesting for for both of us is that we sort of have our feet planted very firmly in how things used to be done in animation and how they're done now and it's changed a lot over the years it's it's we've seen a, a big change in how right. animation is is done and uh, it's it's and we've gotten to be part of that so yeah. you know we've taken that ride and it's been it's been cool okay thank and you next question please this is a comment and not a question when it comes to animated disney movies people will say fantasia is the best or being a beast is the best mm. i think aladdin is the best wow. animated disney movie ever Thank, Thank you. you. Right. Thank you for your comment. Thank you for the comment. Very nice. Next question, please. He, he can say the names. <laughs> That's right. Thank Hi, you. I'm Hannah. Um, so I remember that you talked about improv. I was just wondering if you remember your first experience um, doing improv. Well, I remember my first experience doing it in a recording studio, and it was with Robin Williams. So <laughs> mine was an unforgettable first experience for sure. I personally was not a 
I, I was never really good at improv when I was younger. I, I didn't, it, it made me uncomfortable or something. I don't know. Uh, it's difficult. It's not so easy. And it, you have to sort of just let go of everything in order to be really good at it, I think. And uh, I discovered that it was a lot of fun at a certain point in my life, thanks to a certain parrot that we both loved and adored, admired, and missed very much. Uh, it really, it really changed things for me. Gilbert, I can say Gilbert changed it for me, yeah. Wow. Yes. Okay, got time for a few more. Hi. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I know, it's loud, right? <laughs> sorry. I know. <laughs> um, I, I have kind of a, a two, two questions, but, and they're kind of different from each other. In your experience working together, were you two in the same room working together recording? Or were you separate? And what was the experience like with that? We the, were. The experience is that sometimes you're working with everybody, a lot of people. Sometimes you're working just with one other person. Sometimes you're working by yourself. And sometimes you're working with a reader, uh, just a, a reader. Right. And those right. are sort of the... And Jonathan and I have gotten to work together a lot because we've had a lot of scenes together. So we were fortunate to be in the studio together. Depends how the, how the piece is structured. When, um, I just, uh, second part to that, when we did television animation for this project, um, Gilbert Gottfried and I were in a studio alone together in New York for most of the television animation portion um, and that was a great experience it was just something special that I'm so glad I got that time with him everyone else was in California your character wasn't in that I'm going part to just give a shot a shout out right now to Gilbert because yes. what a lot of people don't know is that he was a lovely sweet compassionate man, a wonderful husband, and a great Dad, father. Yeah. And um, whenever I used to talk about this in public with him, he used to say, you're going to ruin my career if you keep <laughs> talking about me in that way. Uh, but now I can talk about him all I want. Sorry, Gilbert. And then I just wanted yes. to ask, obviously, I'll give you three guesses as to what my favorite movie is, but I would like to know what your personal favorite movie is, just on a personal note. Movie or, what do you just mean? any movie, any movie yeah, that is just oh. your personal, like what? I want to answer this question, but I feel like we are getting into dangerous yeah. territory. Yeah. That's, that's, I'm yeah. talking about, yeah. sorry. I'm so sorry, okay. but no, okay. if you come to the table, I'll tell you. There you go. <laughs> That's a great I'll way around there. it. Okay. Thank you. Once again, they have a photo up right after this, and then they're going to be doing some signing. And uh, right. let's get to the last couple. Okay. Hi there. My name is Megan. Hi, Megan. Hi. Um, I had a question in regard with working in animation. Did you have a lot of experiences working with like head animators, or was it more of like a distant process with that? I had um, my animator lived in Orlando, and I was recording in Los Angeles. So he got to see everything that I was doing, but it was a little bit deeper into the process that I was able to actually meet him. And I did get to go to Orlando, meet him in person, and we are friends to this day. So I, I have a, a very special bond with my lead animator. Same with me, but I... He was in California, and I spent a lot of time with Andreas Deja, fantastic principal animator, and uh, I learned yeah, a lot. You can from say him. their names, yeah. yeah. Mark Hen. Yeah. Mine is Mark Hen. Yeah, they're, they're, It was just a fantastic experience working with Andreas. I learned a lot. He's still animating, I think, on his own now. But thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. All right, we have two more. Hi, I'm Mary. Um, Hi, Mary. I was just wondering, do you think you have more fun doing voice acting roles or live action roles now? For me, voice acting for sure. So it is where I feel the most free to be in a studio, to not have the distractions of equipment and 
waiting and all of the things that come with doing a film. Stage is another animal that is huge challenge. I love all of those challenges and those ways of storytelling, but I feel the most free and authentic in the recording studio. And it's very comfortable. You can just show up in your pajamas. Thank you know, you. I, if there's a lot of other hocus pocus you have to go through for film, television, theater, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. And our final question, no pressure, just make it really, really good. Yeah. I'll try. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lori. Um, Hi, Lori. I was just curious, just with the media that you guys have worked with in the past, do you ever find yourself when you're watching somebody doing puppeteering or doing voiceover work where you kind of get lost in the, oh, I wonder how they did this, or um, kind of picking apart um, the way that it's done versus paying attention to what's actually happening? Oh, I see what you're saying. Like sometimes because we know how it's made, <laughs> yes, are we able to enjoy it in the same way? For me, the answer to that is yes. And I, I can turn off my process and just watch something and enjoy it as a viewer. Um, and, you know, for us, we've been exposed to so much and, and continue to be like, I... I don't know. Do you guys know who Chris Kirkpatrick is? He was here earlier. Yeah. So Chris mm -hmm. and I just were judges for a live reality lip sync competition benefiting Give Kids the World, which is an organization that we all work with. So it, Chris Kirkpatrick, who was amazing at it, it was my first time ever being a judge of anything. I started with a 10, and then I felt bad because everyone was better than the first act, so I gave everyone a 10 for the whole show. I was like, I am not good at this. I just gave everyone a 10. But the point is that we are constantly being exposed to new opportunities, and I feel like I can enjoy things as a spectator and as a viewer just the same as if I'd never been on the other side of it. Uh, there's still ways that people surprise me, and in, in a great way, so. Very cool. Thank you, guys. It's Thank you so much. Actually, I have a quick follow-up to that. Yes. Have you ever watched something and enjoyed it so much that you went back to kind of pick it apart and figure out how they did that? Because that, that was such an awesome scene or, you know. That is a really good question. I I have occasionally heard something and I was so curious how they were doing this particular accent or this particular characterization that I will practice it in my own home, in the privacy of my own home, to see like how how is my mouth moving to make that sound that I heard. And I've been doing that since I was probably eight years old. I used to drive my grandma crazy. She'd be like, stop repeating the Star Kiss commercial. Like, she would just get so annoyed. It was, it was really something that was always in me. That old-fashioned Pittsburgh dialect, in fact, yes. is fantastic. And it's not so easy to do. You have to really, you have to really key into it. Jonathan's been practicing that since yesterday. He has. He has. He's like, did you hear that? And then he'll do it. Yeah. I love it. Is that, do people still, is it like an old-fashioned, a different generation, or what? It's, no? It's its own thing. A mixture, yeah. It's great. Don't ever let go of it. <laughs> I mean it. Well, thank you so much for coming out. What thank a joy. You, everyone. Give it up. Jonathan Freeman, Linda Lark, you can do better than that. Linda Lark and Jonathan Freeman. That video was delicious. And good for you, too. I know I'm a doctor. And I'm also poor, which is hellaciously funny because you'll never see a poor doctor. Trust me and subscribe already. Have fun and eat another video.